thanks for the invitation to come out, uh, which went to Natalia appropriately, the initial invitation. <laughs> um, well, this is going to take some getting used to. I'm usually used to working off of slides. Both of us are. Um, so I just have to run the PowerPoint in my head. Um, I'm assuming that most of you probably have some general familiarity with uh, the early uh, people in the New World, the earliest archaeology, like Clovis and Folsom, that sort of thing. If, if you don't, just shake your head because I need to get a feel for who. Okay, I see some, all right, I see some shaking heads. So um, we were just talking about it at my table. I've been here almost 10 years now, and, and one of the, the, my interest in archaeology for a long time, but particularly since I got here, has been uh, the peopling of the earliest peopling of the Southwest, Paleo Indian archaeology. And um, there are not a lot of sites intact in the ground from Paleo Indian times in the Southwest. Arizona, southeast Arizona, however, around Sierra Vista, from Sierra Vista to Naco, however, has the highest concentration of Clovis, intact Clovis sites, the highest concentration of mammoth kills anywhere in North America, Clovis mammoth kills, and possibly the highest concentration for a moment in time of mammoth kills anywhere in the world. And I've been aware of that forever since I've been in archaeology. It's very well known. And outside of those sites, though, there are very few intact sites in the southwest from the early, from Paleo-Indian times. <clears throat> and every time I was on a field trip down there, I'd been on several field trips before I moved, one question would always come up, particularly when you're in Naco, because you're, you're literally at the Naco site, you're 200 meters or less from the border. So the question always came up, well, what's going on over there? And nobody knew. Um, so when I got here, fortunately, when I got here, a mutual friend of ours, uh, Lupita Sanchez, was working on her PhD. In, in our department in anthropology at the U of A. And Lupita is a Mexican archaeologist, and she and, and Natalia have worked together a lot. And Lupita's interest was Paleo Indian archaeology. So we immediately started uh, working up some plans to go looking for early sites in Sonora. And let's see, that was 02. And uh, we, we knew of a number of surface sites, <clears throat> sites where Clovis artifacts, uh, which there's some photographs on one of those handouts of, of Clovis artifacts. And uh, you know what I'll do, so you have an idea what I'm talking about. This is a cast of a Clovis point. It's a Clovis point from Oregon. It's a plastic cast. But you'll get an idea for what it looks like. So I'm going to start circulating it around. It's the only cast I have. And it's in this little bag. So if you could keep it in the bag, I would appreciate it. And it, it's made of uh, uh, plastic. And you can get a feel for the size and shape and the workmanship. We worked on Natalia. This is where I first met Natalia, working on some sites in Sonora with the Pitas crews, sites that had produced Clovis material on the surface. And which was great. I mean, there, there's a lot. We know now, we knew, we realized right away, there's, there's a good Clovis presence from here all the way south of Aramisillo, probably to Wymus, and uh, west to the Gulf uh, at the surface. That was good. That was good to know, because nobody had documented that before. Uh, Lupita's crew uh, with Natalia and some others, one of my students, uh, documented quite a few sites. There was one known before we started, but we documented a couple of dozen, I guess, some big ones. But what we were looking for was a site to dig, to excavate in situ. Well, to back up, about 10 years ago, Lupita and my predecessor, Vance Haynes, who, who made part of his career working on the early sites around Sierra Vista, Vance and Lupita were down looking for sites and they were in a little town about halfway between uh, the border and Hermosillo. And they saw some mammoth bone in a little museum. And they were asking, and um, 
the museum owner said, oh yeah, those, Mr. So-and-so brought those in. He has a ranch where he's been turning up big bones. Oh, well, okay. So then they, they went to a restaurant to eat, and lo and behold, this rancher happened to show up. Um, Gustavo. What's his name? Gustavo. You remember his last name? Gustavo. I'm drawing a blank. I've known him for five years now. Um, <laughs> on his last name. Anyway, the ranch owner, Gustavo, showed up and said, hey, you know, you, I hear you've been looking for me. And, and they said, yeah, you know, we want to see this, where your bones are coming out. I said, oh, you know, there's lots. Just take that road. It's 20, no, it's 60 kilometers. It'll take you about three hours. <laughs> well, yeah, that was in 1999, I believe, and they never got down there. But anyway, once Lupita got going on her dissertation research, she was determined to go to the site, and he, she called, and the guy, this is five years later, and he said, you know, I've been waiting to, <laughs> to take you out there. And they get out there, and sure enough, there was a t mammoth tusk coming out of the ground and lots of bone coming out. And what they found, can I borrow the other, the photo, the field photo? This, this photo here, they found this island, this little island of sediment. It's not much bigger than what's in the photograph. Kind of a little bit bigger than about the shape of this area, actually, more or less, a little longer. And there was bone coming out all around the base of that island. And uh, then they found, that tool my finger is on, and it was at the base of the island, and you could take a plumb bob and go straight up from the artifact, and there was bone, and the cast, the impression of that artifact was in the bone bed. So they knew it had fallen out. We, we, at that moment, though, we didn't know what the bone bed was, because the mammoth, the tusk and all, was still deeper. Anyway, so we got interested. Uh, there's an artifact that they don't sh that we don't have on here, but another artifact was found the next day that looked like it was Clovis. It wasn't a Clovis point, but it had some Clovis uh, affinities. For those of you who know about these things, we found a biface with an overshot flake, and so an overshot flake is a very specific kind of flake that is it's not unique to Clovis, but it's characteristic. And I'm 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 drawing a blank now. I think it was the next week they came back, and. One. found this point on the ground and then we knew we had a Clovis site. We, we still didn't know the details, we didn't know exactly where it was coming from because we have two bone levels we finally realized. So anyway, we, we started the digging in uh, the fall of 07 and that's when that field photograph was taken. If I could borrow that back. So what they're doing here the darker layer, the upper meter and a half, uh, those are lake sediments. That's one of the things that interested me. Uh, I'm, my background is partly in geology. And the bone bed was at the bottom of lake sediments. And what they're doing there is they're peeling off those lake deposits to expose a bone bed. And it's the bone bed where that one scraper came from. And uh, so we've put in Four seasons, Natalia's been the crew chief for the last two of those four. And just a few weeks ago, they pretty much finished digging, I'm not gonna say digging everything there is to dig, but they've, we've gotten the bone bed about where my finger is to the left. That is all gone now, thanks to four years of digging. And they went through the upper bone bed and on down and expose some of the other bones. As far as we can tell, there's nothing else left there to the, to my right, I'm sorry. So this way, there's no archeology span as far we, as we can tell. This way, there is loads of archeology span and it's all gone. And that map with the, with the projecto points, it's a map, if you look at, look at it carefully, it's a map of the upper bone bed. And there's two animals, parts of two elephants. Um, we got the last little remnant of this thing as it was eroding away. And so um, what we're trying to do is get it all out before it all goes away. And in the meantime, mapped out a, this bone bed. It's, two, it's parts of two elephants 
Classically, stereotypically, Clovis is associated with mammoth. It didn't seem like mammoth as we were exposing it because they weren't very big. And at one point we thought it was bison. Uh, but finally what happened was we found a mandible. It was upside down. It was elephant. It was very obviously elephant mandible, but we didn't know what kind of elephant. We, th we thought maybe mastodon. Mastodons weren't as big as mammoth. But there, and there are some Clovis mastodon sites. So they, they took it back to Mexico City and worked on it and realized it wasn't a mammoth and it wasn't a mastodon. It was a third kind of elephant that's common in Central and South America called a gomphothere. And it's about, it, it looks like a mastodon. It has straight tusks, but it's about the same size as a mastodon. So it'd be probably as high as that wall. And it's the first archeological ma uh, gomphothere in North America. They're relatively common in early sites in Central and South America, but nobody's ever found a, a gomphothere that young, that late in North America. It's the first archaeological gomphothere, so that was exciting. And then, uh, finally, the last two seasons, we started turning up Clovis points. Um, the three in the middle, the two at the top and the one at the bottom, uh, came out, and then, and then uh, Natalia's crew found one more a few weeks ago at the base of the bone bed. So we've got three four Clovis points in place, uh, several around that island. And then the other part of the story I haven't even mentioned, on the uplands, you walk up, like where I'm standing when I took this photograph, I'm at about the level of the top of that island. And the landscape slopes up and all in, to the south and east. And on that surface, we found quite an extensive camp used by Clovis people, because we found Oh gosh, I guess eight, eight or nine Clovis points and Clovis preforms and a whole bunch of tools. It's a really extensive camp. And there's only one other site at Sierra Vista that has a similar situation where you have both the camping area and the kill site together. So what we've been doing um, for four seasons in the winter is uh, digging and mapping the camp. Um, I'll stop there and let Natalia talk some. She's been running the day-to-day -day activities and she could tell you about our camp and life down there. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. It's very remote. Oh, I forgot to tell you the, the story behind the name of the site, El Fin del Mundo. When they first went to look at it in 07 and they finally got there, the crew finally got out there with the landowner, somebody in the truck said, uh, I think we're at the end of the world <laughs> in Spanish because this Mexican archaeologist and the name stuck El Fin del Mundo, the end of the world. So after you get there, it's about three and a half hours on bad road <laughs> to the nearest pavement in any direction. Um, and the, so Natalia's driven that road many times now. So. How far south of the border is it? Oh, I'm sorry. It's northwest of Aramisillo. From here, it's 300 kilometers, so that's going to be about, what, 180 <coughs> miles southwest. And so northwest of Aramisillo, northeast of Tiburon Island, <laughs> southeast of Carbo, if that means anything. Yeah, it's, it's out there. It really is out there. Okay, I'll turn this over to Natalia Martinez. She's one of our star graduate students in the anthropology department. Cool, thanks for that. I have the microphone Oh, I'm sorry, here. that's right. Hopefully it works good. So thank you everybody for coming. This is uh, great. I think these venues are amazing to just to get together people from different backgrounds and create like good conversations. So thank you. Um, I guess I wanted to emphasize a few things uh, talking about what I just say. I think like collaborations are key. So even though obviously you now just see us, this work is the effort of like, it's a real team effort. Like a lot of people are working together and coordinating together, people from different backgrounds. And so it's just great what comes out of this. And then emphasizing on that, this is like a true binational collaboration, which I think is great, you know, like, um, where scholars from the U.S. and scholars from Mexico have opportunities to work together and like and create these type of projects, um, just so that you know, like in North Mexico, um, it's pretty like understudied. You know, you have the Southwest area where a lot of effort has been put on, and then you have the Mesoamerican region farther south, and then you have this huge area in between that, that needs a lot of people and needs more loving, which is great to work out. But these type of collaborations are great because we provide like people, like Mexicans 
we provide our expertise and then uh, United States scholars provide their expertise. So I wanted to kind of like start off on that, which takes me to this like team effort thing. So we like to call ourselves the Cloviceros. So, <laughs> but it's, uh, and, and yeah, it's been, it's just great. Like everybody that has worked there, it's just amazing. So I want to start off at what Vance mentioned. Like I took off after Net Gains uh, did the, fil the first two seasons. So it was easy and hard, you know, it was hard to get in and to have like all these expectations to fulfill after he had done a, a great job. He had some personal issues, so he couldn't keep going. But then again, um, going beyond that difficultness, it was actually very easy because he provided, he made it happen, right? He made this transition really easy for me. Like he taught me like the methodology behind it and like all the, the things that I, that I needed to know. So that was like a great start. And like him and uh, Mike Brack had already started like the whole thing, like the greed, like the datums, like, so it was like really easy to just jump on that, right? Mm -hmm. And then um, just want to tell you a little bit more about the team. So we're mainly the people that I've worked with. There's people like from the different fields and seasons. It would be impossible to name everybody. But uh, we've worked, um, when I have been there, it's been mainly Mexican archaeologists, undergraduate students. In Mexico, undergraduate programs are a little bit uh, harder in terms of you have to do a, a thesis at the end. So these uh, students get really involved, right? Sometimes they just love the field work and they go there as a job, but, the, but some of them have their thesis to work on. So they really get involved in data analysis and all that. So, so it was just great to have them. The other component of the team was a workman from uh, the closest town. Uh, it's called uh, Gomez Felix, like Depot, it's called the closest town in the area. And that was crucial. Like the first um, season, Ned didn't have them. And then Ned hired them on the second season. And I was lucky to have them on the third and fourth season. And that was just crucial, right? Like obviously they learn a bunch from us and like the archeology span and the, the mammoth and all that. But then again, without them, it would be like super hard, right? They know the area. They help us um, with the campsite a lot. They build us the latrine, like they make this happen, right? And then the, obviously we cannot leave out the cook, right? Like thanks to the cook, like everything goes pretty smooth after that. And that just emphasizing on the story that Vance just told, like when they finally made it to the site, like Ned and uh, Beto Peña, they were like r super excited looking at the stratigraphy, like the profile, like looking at the bone, they found that scraper. And suddenly like the cowboy that takes care of the land just scream at them and like pull out this big biface, like this big. To, and he was like, what are you doing? This is what they used to kill the animals for you. Yeah, like he kind of had it already figured out, which is great. So that's kind of like the work that's been going down there. The other thing that I missed that made the transition easy was that um, students that work with Ned were also with me. And that made it like extra easier for me to just kind of follow up on, on his work. Mm. And then I also wanted to just talk a little bit about the campsite, like the logistics of it. So as Van says, it's pretty remote. I mean, in the terms of distance is far, but it's just the dirt road is really bad. And then it loops, like it does this like almost 360 turnaround. So you're kind of going and then you loop around these big mountains. So it takes forever to get there. But it also provides us the opportunity to camp out there, you know, which is challenging and it creates a lot of more risks in, in terms of being like super far. I think we're like three hours from a hospital. Like we definitely have to be more aware that we're there, but it also provides this opportunity of be where like the Palio Indians were, right? Like camping there where they were and like, um, so that's great. Of course we have like electricity through a <laughs> ga gas generator and uh, some gas for the stove and so, which makes Water. it easier. Yeah, that's a big thing. Like the rancher has facilitated us um, to be there and provides water for us. So um, yeah, we obviously even even in the can you hear me? Even in the in the winter when, when we do our work, I mean you you got to have water. And he's very kindly let us use a well he has on his ranch, and it's great water. And I, I we wouldn't be out there. We couldn't do it without that one crucial. You get by without a generator. You can get by without a lot of things, obviously, but. Um, water and uh, but even that's logistically a problem because it's about an hour round trip and we have to devote a truck and a big tank so 
you know, you get the idea. Yeah, so um, it is challenging, as I say, and, and we have to be more careful of what we do, like whatever things that, that you, yeah, you just have to be more careful. But then again, it's great, you know, to have that opportunity to be six, there, six weeks there in the middle of nowhere. It really makes you like consider a lot of things when you come back. <laughs> so, and yeah, and finally, I just wanted to just transmit that feeling of finding these things, you know, because it's, sometimes it's easier to people to be really, uh, excited about like royal tombs or like really like fancy archaeological like uh, discoveries uh, and then they don't really get that we get so excited about these stone tools but then again yeah just to transmit that feeling of like grabbing that po those points for the first time after like 12,000 years or so it's pretty exciting and we were all like super lucky and like almost shedding tears so <laughs> it's definitely so it's a really rough type of archaeology because we are digging up uh, soils that have been like pretty much solidified through these thousands of years so it's not easy right you're like scraping through all these things and then things don't come out like you could be days and not even like a tiny piece of flake comes out so it's easy to be like ah why are we doing this but then when it finally comes out then it's just one of the best feelings for sure so. yeah we yeah that's actually a good point i should also add the the, the bone is in terrible shape uh, it's much, basically it's much softer than what they're digging through. So that, that's also imposed a lot of logistical problems, just getting the bone out of the ground. Um, <clears throat> but we've had great crews, this fantastic crews. I've, I've been doing archeology span for over 30 years and the crews we have down there is as good as any and better than a lot of the ones I've worked with. And I'm, I'm glad that, uh, Natalia brought up the international cooperation. I should mention or emphasize that. So. Uh, I'm here at the U of A in, the, in anthropology and geosciences and then uh, have students here. I don't have anybody actually working on the project for a, like a thesis or anything, but a lot of people have devoted a lot of time, particularly Natalia. And then in uh, Mexico, the um, Instituto Nacional de Antropología y Historia, yes. correcto? INA, <laughs> in, uh, in, in Mexico City and then the INA office in uh, Hermosillo. My, co my co collaborator, Lupita Sanchez, has, has been at, worked at both, and, and that's made a huge difference. And so she and I are co-PIs, so it's, a, it's a definitely a joint endeavor, and um, the, the regular crew are, are just superb uh, Mexican archaeologists, and, uh, and, and uh, Natalia's been part of that, and then students who've helped me down there have gone down with me. And then uh, one of the things, she mentioned Mike Brock with uh, Desert archaeology, uh, desert has helped. Uh, we've had help from a number of agencies. National Geographic has supported us. Ina has supported us, but also desert has provided Mike Brock services for mapping and grinning the site. He's put in a lot of time, and so given in particular this venue, I want to make sure that, that we acknowledge the help we've gotten from now from the, uh, from the um, Southwest Archaeology. Uh, is Mike, he's, he's, does he work for Desert, yeah, but but Bill Doley has very kindly, uh, and Mike has done a lot of work in Mexico, so uh, we we really appreciate that a lot, and uh, um, look forward to more work down there in the area. We're looking for more sites. Uh, there's work to do, and then of course we've got to start getting this stuff uh, published. Um, I was going to say something. Oh, <laughs> back to the very big picture. There are very few early sites, in, intact early sites have been excavated and reported in Mexico. It's possible that El Fino Mundo is the first. I'm not 100% sure of that. It's one of the first. In part, for, for reasons Natalia was mentioning, over the years the focus has always been on the monumental stuff in central and southern Mexico. And northern Mexico has gotten short shrift, yeah. And so, for the, for the Mexican archaeologists who are interested in the hunters and, hunters and gatherers rather than the monument builders, uh, this has been a great uh, opportunity for them. And I'm, I'm very thankful, uh, all of us up here are, that they have invited us in to work together. And uh, it's, yeah, it's been a terrific uh, learning experience for me personally and then professionally satisfying and, and all that. It's, it's, it's fun, I have to say. <laughs> It's working. <laughs> <laughs> um.
just open it up. For yeah. So we have time question? Sure. Yeah. For those of us who are not geologists, can you give me a little uh, idea of what time period we're talking oh. about for this, this whole area? Yeah. Um, one of the, the one of the very few frustrations with this project is figuring out how old our bone bed is. But in general, Clo the Clovis artifacts are going to be about twelve thousand years old. We don't know exactly how old our site is. We've tried to date everything we can put our get our hands on. We've one of the other things that's come up that's been exciting in the last two seasons in the Titus crew is we found just a few teeny tiny pieces of charcoal. So we've got uh, hopes uh, that maybe, it's our last hope, truly, maybe we could get uh, uh, some reliable results. Otherwise, it's just going to be one of those things we will, we will never know exactly how old it is. But because the point style is dated at other sites, we can, we can at least say it's around 12,000 years old. And those, so those lake beds started forming. I should mention that. Um, it was, we, I think there was a spring feeding uh, some kind of a stream. And then uh, that probably attracted animals. There's other bones below the bone bed. And then as that spring activity was beginning to wane, uh, these animals, these two gomphotheres, we, we assume were killed. It's possible they were scavenged, were killed and then left. And then almost immediately after that, a lake formed. And so the lake is, is just after Clovis times and covered that. And it remained covered until all the erosion probably fairly recently exposed that landscape. And I, I should mention, I mean, there must have been a big site there at one time, but all we have is this little strip that you can see on that map that's no bigger than this area right here. Okay, questions over here? Okay. And then next was here. Please define la palabra lasca. ¿Qué significa lasca? Uh, it's a flake. Uh, yeah. 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 Flakes that were presumably uh, chipped off the artifacts, maybe for resharpening them. You mentioned that this was an island, um, and I, I can't quite tell from looking at the picture. Are you talking about something in the middle of a large arroyo or an yes. island of what? Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's, it's an island of lake bed, lake deposits, that has been uh, eroded, very heavily eroded. So you're looking at one side of the island, and then it's only a few meters wide, so you climb up on top of that and ju then jump down into a very deep arroyo. It literally sticks up. Imagine that this wall had a, had a roof over it. That's about the size of this thing. It's sticking up all by itself because of very intense erosion. So there are royals all around it. And so it's this one little remaining chunk of lake bed with the bone that we got. Does that, does that make more sense? Yeah. It wasn't Thank an you. island, but. It, it wasn't an island at the time it was it occupied. It's an eroded. island today. Yeah, I, I'm so used to using the terminology that I lose the, the larger Clovis uh, realm that you point, pointed out, like from Sierra Vista and Naco down to Hermosillo or Wymas, do you visualize or do you understand from flora and fauna and uh, any, any, other, any other clues that that was one homogeneous climatic realm at that time and was it was it different from the surroundings? I mean, was it open grassland and that, that was not true if you went 20, 50 miles away? Or? Don't know. That's, that's one of the, the questions we have. There's been a lot of that sort of paleo environmental and paleo vegetation reconstruction in southern Arizona. But we're, we're literally in the, just the very beginning stages of this in Sonora. In fact, one of the things about this site is it's got a good we think it has a good record of past vegetation preserved and we're desperately searching for research support just uh thursday i got my third turn down from the national science foundation so <laughs> when they tell you third time is charm don't believe me so, and that's exactly one of the things we want to know about and in fact the other part of that proposal was to look at the the stone tool assemblages which is about all we have from most sites through this area, compare all the different 
Clovis stone tool assemblages down there with the stone tool assemblages we have up here in the San Pedro Valley. But again, that awaits, that's what awaits us. I see Alan back there, he wants to, <laughs> he's in tears. <laughs> he wants to see this. Um, <clears throat> one of the great mysteries of, of, of Clovis, as you, you, you know, is the fact that we found tools and animals and whatnot, but we haven't found people except in, in the instance of Montana and the child burial uh, in, in Montana. And I'm just wondering what, you know, what's become of that, what you think about that. There are, there are very few human remains from the Paleo-Indian period in general, mm -hmm. say anything older than about eight or 10,000 years when you get back that far. Mm -hmm. There are maybe a dozen and a half human remains mm -hmm. for the time period, say 10,000 to 13,000 mm -hmm. on the continent. So it's, it's probably, they, people just weren't practicing, they weren't, they didn't have burial practices like we think of very often, there are a few sites that are clearly, people are buried in pits. So you don't have many people to begin with on the landscape, and, and I'm assuming that they're either not burying them, or they're burying them in places that don't last, or we just haven't found. But yeah, there's one that might be Clovis age, but they're, they're not a whole lot, even mm -hmm. in the few thousand years later than that. It's, it's, they're, we're not finding them for whatever reason, mm -hmm. so either we're looking in the wrong places or maybe they just weren't burying people. Well, do, do you know about this Montana burial of the child? Yeah, yeah it's called the Anzic site. Huh? Yeah, it's right. It's quite well known, yeah. yeah well, how, what, what's the current status about that particular site, do you know? It's on private land, uh, although the site was destroyed by, uh, by accident, by bulldozing. Uh -huh. So there wasn't, there's not much there when they found it. Uh, as far as I know, it's all in a museum. I'm, I'm off the top of my head, I can't remember where, in Montana. Uh -huh. and, and people have done a lot of work on both the Clovis tool assemblage as well as the human remains. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's safe and, and available for study. The, the, there there the, are a few publications on the, it. The, the other question, what's your personal view about pre-Clovis uh, uh, occupation of the New World? <laughs> I'm, I think it's, it was there. I think it, it's, it was a very very skimpy occupation right at the threshold. You know, you, you think if, if you, you add, say, one person on the North American continent, we will never see the record of that, right? So you keep adding people. At some point, it, there's going to be a, a threshold of visibility where you will begin to see the archaeological record. And I think, I think we're right at that threshold, and I don't think we're ever going to go beyond it. I think there was probably a, a very minimal population on the continent that may not have anything to do with Clovis, may not have even been, you know, predecessors to Clovis. And then Clovis, or their immediate predecessors, arrived from Beringia and very quickly colonized the continent. But I think there was a very minimal population, a very minimal human presence, probably by a few thousand years. And I'm basing that just on the fact that there's so few sites that are even debatable, much less agreed upon. There are almost none that are agreed upon. There may be half a dozen that are probably reasonable candidates, at least in my view. And I think that's telling us something. And we've been looking. I've got, I've very, one of the things about my job here is I, it was an endowment that came with it to look for paleo Indian sites. And it's one of six endowments across the country. And so these have been going now for between 10 and 15 years. And the, the person who endowed it is a, is a retired geologist in Denver. Uh, he's convinced that there were people in the Americas 25,000 years ago. And to be honest, the, the irony of this is that he will have spent more money looking for Paleo-Indian sites than any National Science Foundation or anybody else. And, and he is, his efforts will probably show us how minimal the pre-Clovis presence was, at least that's my view. We, we were looking. We'll be putting out money, you hope you never find it. <laughs> well, he gets mad when we don't Okay, so. we have another question here. Yeah. Did the Clovis materials at this site suggest that they came from that area or that they were uh, points made for materials in trade goods brought from other areas? 
Mm, sure. I mean, uh, this last season we actually found um, inside the, the the site area uh, rhyolite out, outcast, like and with really good quality of rhyolite that looks like the sort of uh, one the last Clovis point we found, and definitely a lot of like work. There's a lot of preforms of before it becomes a Clovis, like this biphase technology. And uh, we have located a whole area where they are definitely extracting it. So there's napping stations right there where they're getting them. And then we have another area where they're making like more fine tuned work, right? So at first they extract big flakes and then in another area they do the, the, the soil work. So that's for some of the materials. Others are from a quartz source and we have located um, uh, I'm a big uh, quartz hill like um, like source, but it, we obviously don't know if it's the exact same quartz, but it's possible. So so far we just have those two sources. This last season we put a lot of effort into finding uh, cobbles from different materials of from the arroyo, like trying to match. And yeah, we did kind of find some jasper that looks like uh, like some of the of the artifacts. But yeah, definitely nothing for sure so far that would like guarantee that is the same uh, the same sources and some of the points are from yeah other materials that we don't really know my uh, my collaborator uh, Lupita Sanchez did her PhD dissertation on paleoindian in general but Clovis in northern Mexico and that's one of the questions she has her feeling is that most of the raw materials are relatively local uh, from northern Sonora uh, but that's another part of uh, what we want to do is try to get a better handle on that. One thing I should mention, just as a point of interest, she mentioned the quartz. This point here, this Clovis point, was found out of place. Uh, it's clear, it's made of clear crystal quartz. You can see right through it. It's like a window pane. Uh, it's quite spectacular. And we found several artifacts of this clear quartz material, and there is an outcrop about 10 kilometers away, but we haven't made the, the match. Thank you. I'm stuck in the cubby hole. I can't. Oh, there you are. Hi. Um, I was curious how this site was discovered. Oh, well, the, the, the rancher um, had spotted these bones and knew about them for years. In fact, a lot of the local cowboys apparently knew about it. We met one of the fellows, came out, that, that remembers when the, when the mammoth tusk was still intact and all that. And so then he got in touch with. Uh, some people I know, and then we finally went back to look. This is one of the things, anytime there's a report of big bones, if it's long as it's not dinosaurs or something like that, we'll usually go, and maybe one time out of 100 it'll be an archaeological site. So this, this time it paid off, yeah, big time. I, well, just to add, we were really lucky that the owner of the ranch had that interest, right, and he preserved it and, like, yeah. and allow us to go there, because it's happened before where they don't let us in <laughs> to their private ranches, so. Yeah, he's very enthusiastic about our work and he's always welcoming us, and welcoming, welcoming us back and always wants to know when we're coming back and this is a terrific guy and the cowboys who worked out there, they're quite patient. <laughs> Among the um, very few or half dozen Clovis human finds, um, is there any DNA evidence in terms of whether there's a continuum from Clovis all the way up toward modern people, or is there a, any d evidence of a disconnect? The DNA in, in most of those early remains is not preserved. There are a couple of sites. In Oregon. Okay. Yeah, there was this controversial one in uh, Oregon, Washington. In Oregon, Washington. Oregon, no? Kennewick. Oh, well, Kennewick? no, I was thinking Kennewick. of Norway. Okay. That they got the... Yeah, there are a few, mm -hmm. and... Uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not related, it's not connected with Clovis material. No, no, Kennewick was later. No, there's only one that's pretty clearly Clovis, and that was uh, Anzic, and I don't believe they've recovered DNA. you got to have it preserved in the bone, and it's, it's actually not easy to do to preserve it. And that's the hope, is to try to recover some DNA from some of these bones. But all, all the indications are that they're, they're all Asian. Whether there's a direct link to, I don't think 
that leakage has been made one way or the other enough to say whether there's a direct link to Clovis. The, the problem, one of the things they like to have are a lot of samples, and we don't have remotely a lot of samples. So. One sec. Oh, some more. In the San Pedro area, you have the uh, sort of the, the mythical black mat. I shouldn't say mythical, but the, the, the legendary black mat. Is there any sort of geological formation similar to that in these regions, or is that restricted to the San Pedro zone? Well, that's a complicated question, and I'll tell you why. Because the term black mat is it's used in two different ways, and this is, doesn't always come through. There is the black mat, which is this <laughs> deposit that my predecessor, Van Haines, has identified here and there in those sites in the San Pedro Valley. It's an, it's an algal mat. It was apparently uh, algae growing on the surface, like a marshy situation. It's very specific. But then there's this very general term and, it, and he wrote a, Vance wrote a paper on this just a few years ago, and in it he even says this, there's this draw, broader term that includes things that aren't even black. They're white, in fact. He would, he would consider our, this, uh, oh, I didn't mention that. This, there's a lake bed, uh, it didn't show up in this photograph. This, this dark gray zone, right at the bottom of that dark gray zone, there's a, there's a layer, it's about that thick, and it's white, and it's lake deposits. Vance would consider that, in a generic sense, the black mat. Mm -hmm. It's younger. Uh, it means all sorts of things around the country. So, in a, in a specific sense, no, there's not. Um, there's not a black algal mat. Uh, but in a generic sense of this sort of uh, fairly distinctive lake or marsh deposit, yes. But it's also younger, I think, than the classic San Pedro Valley black mat. Does that make any sense? <laughs> yeah, okay. It's not easy. Let's see who's next. Okay, right here. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, you had mentioned that the bone um, was softer than the matrix around it. So I was wondering if you had to do any like plaster casting in order to remove it so you could identify uh, the, the material back in the lab, so that's number one. And then number two, I was wondering, um, is this, if you could tell by the campsite, is this uh, a seasonal camp, is it a single use, or did it look like they had been coming here um, multiple times, I guess? I'll let you start. <laughs> um, well, most of the bone came out when I was not there. So it's a kind of a tricky. Trip we played on <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. To come down and help finish off the bone bed. Lo and behold, it was gone. <laughs> but uh, but I do know that they went through some definitely struggles with that. Like the first few seasons, um, they used casting, and then they actually for the next uh, season they actually contact um, a rester uh, Luisa Maino, I think it's her name. Uh, she's really well known in um, in Central Mexico, and she has a new technique like a new substance that goes on these, uh, on these bones. So thanks to that technique, we started to apply it there and we were able to, to extract some of those. When I was there, there were still some bones coming out, but not like the major big ones. But they, like even before, like they were preserved pretty good. I mean, it's just hard to dig, but definitely what you're seeing in the drawing, I mean, it's not a photo, but they were that shape and they were like there, so for sure. Yeah, they were identifiable. They were. Yeah. Yeah. I can't remember the other half of your question. It's so extensive, and so, we've gotten so many artifacts that we think are Clovis. Uh, it had to be, I think, it had to be used repeatedly. For example, there's a, a very distinctive early tool called a spurred end scraper, and we have uh, 80 or 90 of, of spurred end scrapers. So the, the site, the excavation area, is one of the single event. And of course, it's mostly gone. I mean, literally. This little island that's sticking up is the only place with those lake beds, but there's been a lot of erosion, so we, we, we are figuring that most of the site, the intact site, was eroded away. So uh, people were using that camp, we call it the camp um, area, probably regularly for a while, that's all we can say, because it's all surface.
dozens or how many dozens or hundreds of miles do you have to go to the south to find more remains of these elephants? And are we assuming that they're in between but just haven't been discovered? Boy, you're, you're getting, beginning to get out of my, our areas of expertise. Um, There's they're pretty common in South America. There's some gonfotheres from southern Mexico, I think. Yeah, and mammoth in central, central so Mexico, far, for sure. There's been a lot of uh, mammoth dog in central Mexico, yeah, only... The gumpeteers. Ah, the gumpeteers, yeah, they go through South America, but... They're older ones in North America. Uh, they're not that common in the paleontological record, and they tend to be older. There are older ones scattered, gumpeteers, older in time, pre-people associations, yeah. scattered out through Mexico. In terms of archaeological gumpeteers... It's the only one. In North America. In North America. There, I think there's one or two in, in Central America, south of Mexico. There's some in uh, South America. If you're familiar, somebody asked me about Pre-Clovis, if you're familiar with the Monte Verde site in Chile. It, it, if you read this, the general discussions, they talk about mastodon. One of the things I've learned on this project is in South America, when they say mastodon, they don't mean our mastodon, they mean gumpeteers. So, they're, they're more common down there, but you have to go away south of, our, of Fin del Mundo to find another archaeological gauntlet here. And that's a good question. It's a ways. Uh, I'd say down towards, I just keep, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking in the Panama area, but I could be wrong. It's a ways, yeah. So this is very, very unusual. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah, quite a surprise. Yeah, exciting, too. There was another. Oh. Next question. I was just curious, what other animals did you find other than gampathes? Did you find glyptodonts or dire wolves or, I mean, was glyptodon was the only animal that you found? Other animals? Or gampathes, yeah. rather? In the bone bed with the Clovis materials, only gampathes, mm -hmm. two gampathes. Now, on below, there's some other animals. Mm -hmm. Let me think for a second. Um, there's horse. There's horse, taper, mm -hmm. mammoth. Horse, taper, and mammoth are the ones I can think. I don't believe there's glyptodons or cats. No. But again, or we have a very work. small sample of the older part because it's not archaeological and I mean it's of interest but our money is to do archaeology. And they're work they're working on that. No. No they camels. have some bison maybe no? Yeah I think there's some bison. Yeah and they're they're working on that in uh, Mexico City. All the materials in Mexico uh, well some of it's in Hermosillo and most of the bones in Mexico City. That's okay. a good question, but that's so far, that's our, our inventory. Joaquin Arroyo is the paleontologist that's been working on the bone. Other questions? Well, then I have to ask, um, is the comet theory dead? <laughs> no. No? Still kicking? Oh, yeah. OK. <laughs> yeah, this, just in the last month, there's been, it was pretty quiet for about a year, but it's, it's, it's back. OK. <laughs> Very interesting. Perhaps we'll have another cafe in a year or so. Yeah. <laughs>